how, not how much, Medicare spending and health resource allocation in Australia. And it discusses how and why scarce health resources are used and abused in the government approved manner in this country due to the way that Medicare operates. What well, the paper principally examines are uh, Medicare structural flaws and the way these flaws have reduced the cost, oh, sorry, raised the cost, reduced the quality and restricted access to health services. What it also outlines are the market-based policies that should be implemented to prevent waste, to promote cost effectiveness and ensure sustainability in a rapidly ageing Australia. Now, Before I get into the nuts and bolts of the paper, I want to make a few preliminary comments about some of the issues discussed and the aims of the paper. The most contentious thing in it is the criticisms that I make of um, Medicare's so-called greatest achievement, which is the bulk billing of GP and other medical services, which means that these services are paid for in full by the federal government and are consumed without any uh, user charges. And if you believe the hype, bulk billing is the program which ensures our, our health system is equitable and properly protects the poorest citizens against the risk of ill health. Now for a range of reasons, from wasteful overuse to the impact on access to hospital services, the paper's highly critical of bulk billing to the point that it's scrapping and replacement with something better is strongly recommended. The something better is taking the money that we spend on Medicare and using it to establish a national system of personalised health savings accounts to pay for minor expenses like occasional GP visits, and a national health insurance voucher scheme to cover high cost, high cost chronic and catastrophic conditions. Now even my friends um, have described the proposed reforms as heroic, which I think is code for never going to happen. <laughs> now it's worth reflecting on this sentiment because it's a very common one. And what I think it is, is an example of the defeatist attitude, which tends to animate, if that's the right word, the debate about health reform. Now, the usual formulation is that bulk billing is such a sacred cow, beloved to politicians, doctors and voters alike, that any government that dared to touch it would be kicked out of office by a ropeable electorate. I gained an insight into this attitude when John Howard spoke about his political memoirs here at CIS last year. Mr Howard volunteered the fact that he had changed his mind about his career-long opposition to Medicare based on the strength of public sentiment, public, sorry, not based on the strength of public support for the scheme. And he certainly put this change of mind into action when in office. Before the 2004 election, the coalition had came under opportunistic attack from the Labor Party because the rate of bulk billing had declined a few percentage points below the long-run average. Historically, approximately 75% of all consultations have been bulk billed and the rate had dipped to something in the, in the high 60s. The Howard government's response was in keeping with its broader political strategy, remembering that the 2004 election marked a new low in Australian politics for electoral friendly handouts. What happened was that the Howard government raised the Medicare medical benefits rebate by 15% to cover 100% of the scheduled fee and introduced a range of new incentives to encourage GPs to bulk bill. The total cost of the package was high. MBS expenditure increased by $1 billion in the first year alone. Let's try and put that into some sort of international context. At a time when Western governments were waking up to, un to the unsustainability of their free health systems and searching for ways to scale them back, the Howard government was adding entitlements to the system. And this was despite the hoopla surrounding Peter Costello's intergenerational reports which warned that under current policy settings, health spending would impose unaffordable burdens on future generations. And why was it doing this? Because of the political salience of bulk billing, because Medicare has fostered a sense of entitlement to free GP visits as some sort of birthright, and because the rate of bulk billing is wrongly equ equated with the health or otherwise of the system. The lesson of this episode is generally depressing. If one of Australia's most successful politicians could ditch the convictions of a political lifetime because reforming Medicare is too hard, what hope is there as change? This is the issue, the political viability of health reform, which is going to top and tail my talk tonight. While the conventional wisdom is that reform of Medicare is a political impossibility, what I would like to suggest is that what this attitude actually reflects are the three great lacks 
of the health debate. The first lack, it almost goes without saying, is lack of political will. This is not just due to timidity born of keeping a close eye on marginal voters, but I think it's also a product of the second lack. This is the lack of understanding among politicians and the general public about how and why Medicare works the way it does, and why the outcomes, particularly in relation to the operation of public hospitals, are so unsatisfactory. My thesis here is that far from the measure of the health of the system, bulk billing is the cancer at the heart of Medicare. The third is lack of honesty. The reality, which few are prepared to acknowledge, is that in a free system such as Medicare, budgets are limited and access to care has to be restricted and services rationed in some way, shape or form. What is completely ignored and denied, and this is one of the major points in my paper, is that rationing of care by means of long queues at overcrowded hospitals is linked to bulk billing for reasons that I hope will be clear to you by the time that I stop talking tonight. Now, if this is clear to you, this is what I hope the paper might do for a wider audience. Now, without having any undue delusions of influence, um, my aim in this paper has been to help fill the second and third voids of understanding and honesty. And by pointing out the defects in the way we currently go about financing healthcare, the hope, the hope is that this may help to generate the political will to do something about it. I hope I don't appear naive and, in fact, I'm as cynical about the political process as anyone, as anyone who might have read my stuff about child protection that Greg mentioned would know. But if the problems with Medicare are as I describe them, then they're both serious and they are systemic, and they will also prove intractable without some kind of fundamental reform. Progress and reform will ultimately depend on the maturity of the public policy debate that we're prepared to have about health. And this is why one of the reasons in this paper I've tried to do more than just come up with another plan of which there are a multitude floating about, but have tried to outline the principles that should inform the debate about structural health reform and underpin an optimal health system. Okay. So to the paper itself. I'd ask you to again cast your mind back, this time to the heady days before the 2007 federal election when Kevin Rudd was still an economic conservative and just a friendly face on Sunrise. <laughs> all, sorry, all of the considerable attention that health policy has received in the last four years has stemmed from two things. <coughs> One is the recurring political nightmare that the public hospital system has become for all state governments due to long waits for both elective and emergency treatment. The second is Kevin Rudd's famous pledge to end the blame game and fix the hospital crisis. And disappointingly, what all the subsequent attention, and, and as I say, considerable attention to health policy has amounted to, in terms of the Rudd and Gillard government's health reform program, <coughs> is a continuation of the long-running squabble between the Commonwealth and the states over the amount of money the feds will or won't make available for public hospitals. Under the original Rudd plan, the Commonwealth was to fund 60% of the cost in return of grabbing 30% of the state's GST revenue. Under the revised Gillard version, the Commonwealth will end up funding 44% of the cost by 2020 and will not claw back the GST. Now, the focus on cost, shift, cost shifting between different government budgets isn't a surprise, given the vertical fiscal imbalance in the Federation. And we know that state governments have large and competing service responsibilities and only relatively limited independent sources of revenue. We also know that the Commonwealth has the bulk of the taxing powers and the ability of the states to meet their obligation. Obligations heavily depends on the finan financial largesse or otherwise of the Commonwealth. However, what my paper argues is that, this, is that the focus on this one dimension of the health mess it ignores much bigger and more complex problems with Medicare and with how we go about financing healthcare. What I think we should really be focusing on is not just how much money each government, each tier of government tips into public hospitals, but how all health spending is allocated across the system. And in order to explain why this is so, I'd just like to run you through a few figures. In 2008-09, the total cost of all Medicare-funded medical services, including GP and other non-hospital-based care, was over $15.5 billion. This was approximately double the cost 
of the private hospital system and approximately half as much as combined Commonwealth and state government spending on public hospitals, about $30 billion. To try and put these numbers into some sort of context, I've gone back and looked at government spending patterns in the past. What I found was that in 1967-68, for every $1 spent by Australian government subsidising medical services, $4.83 was spent subsidising hospital services. This was total uh, spending on federal hospital benefits as they then were, and state grants to public hospitals. In those days, there were no queues for hospital treatment to rival the one-third of emergency patients who currently wait longer than eight hours for admission to a bed, and the one in three elective patients who currently wait longer than clinically recommended for surgery. By comparison, in 2008-09, for every one dollar spent on the medical benefits scheme, the total government subsidy for hospital care was only $1.99. Now, these changes certainly reflect clinical advances, such as uh, tests that no longer need to perf be performed in hospitals and can be performed out in the community. But they also reflect the policy upheavals of the 1970s and 80s, which culminated with the establishment of Medicare in 1984. And what I think they draw attention to are two main points. The first is the faulty principles and design flaws of Medicare, which mean that it's not a soundly constructed insurance system. What it is, in fact, is a reverse insurance scheme which provides inverse care. Now what I mean by this is that the minority of patients with major health needs are forced to queue for treatment at overcrowded public hospitals which have capped budgets and rationed care, while the majority, who, who often may have relatively minor needs, receive free or highly subsidised GP visits and other medical services on demand under the uncapped MBS program. The second point is that these figures help explain why 26 years of Medicare have produced the hospital crisis. My argument here is that Medicare wastes scarce resources by encouraging unnecessar unnecessary consultations and tests because consumers can use their Medicare cards to either bulk bill all the cost to the federal government or to receive a rebate covering a significant proportion of the cost of each service. These services, in short, are overused because Medicare oversubsidised the minor healthcare costs associated with, often trivial, with, with the often trivial health needs of millions of Australians at great cost to the federal budget. However, the systemic consequences are far from trivial. High, ever-increasing and open-ended spending on the non-hospital sector has contributed to funding and service imbalances in the hospital sector. To offset high spending on bulk billing and control the total cost of health to the federal budget, the Commonwealth has tightly capped the level of funding made available to the states for public hospital care. Funding has thereby been restricted to the parts of the health system that treat the sickest patients. What Medicare has created is perverse outcomes and inequalities. People are left over entitled at the least acute end of the healthcare spectrum, while the cost of the most serious, most expensive illnesses is inadequately covered. Those without private insurance who are solely dependent on Medicare for hospital care are left underinsured against the risk of serious illness requiring hospitalisation <coughs> and are forced to take what they are given in a public system that arbitrarily and unethically rations free care to control costs. So much for boasts about equity and Medicare protecting poor people. The key issue, as I therefore see it, is resource allocation, or rather how and why health care subsidies are misallocated. My explanation for this is that it is a public choice. Medical services are oversubsidised because bulk billing is electorally popular and it delivers financial handouts to the maximum numbers of voters. Both sides of politics, it follows, are reluctant to discuss the relevant issues because it puts the spotlight on the sacred cow, on the popular entitlement to, on the popular universal entitlement to bulk billing. So in the hope, perhaps the vain hope, of stimulating the debate the politicians don't want to have, what the paper tries to explain is how and why the shift in the balance of government subsidies has occurred. Just as an aside, I might also say that compiling the narrative of policy developments for the paper was really harder than it should have been. And to my knowledge, there isn't a decent academic history of health policy in Australia covering all, um, all the relevant issues, from the rise and fall of the friendly societies to national insurance and, and other issues. Um, so if there's somebody, if there's a, a clever cookie out there who's trialling their coat for a PhD scholarship, I think it's a topic that deserves some attention. Anyway, the story that I tell in my paper begins in the late 1960s 
at a time of growing public dissatisfaction with out-of-pocket costs for medical services. Cost sharing for medical services was a key feature of the pa Page Menzies National Health Scheme, which was specifically designed to cover up to 90% of the cost of only the most expensive medical fees to prevent overuse. I'll go into this in a lot more detail in the paper. But with the Labor Party's plan for a free UK-style national health system setting the, policy, setting the political context, discontent with out-of-pocket charges mounted. What this led to was, was health policy formation descending into something of a bidding war. From the late 1960s, successive federal governments set about creating politically rewarding health entitlement programs which aimed to maximise electoral support by distributing subsidies for medical care widely throughout the community. The politicisation of health which occurred quickly ingrained the electorally sacrosanct notion that all medical services, no matter how minor, should be paid for by government and consumed with no or minimal direct charge to patients. The process began when the Gorton government, the Gorton Coalition government, introduced a new medical benefits scheme in 1970. To counter the electoral appeal of Labor's free scheme, Gorton promised that voters would only have to pay a specified excess of no more than 80 cents out of their own pocket for a general practice consultation where the doctor agreed to charge the government approved most common fee. The Gorton scheme basically paved the way for the start of Medibank in 1975 when bulk billing became available for the first time. The Fraser government's multiple reinventions of Medibank sought to contain federal health expenditure which had exploded under the Whitlam government, but the only lasting policy outcome proved to be a very important change to the way the public hospitals were funded. In 1975 under Whitlam, the Commonwealth had agreed to share recurrent net operating costs of free public hospitals with state governments on a 50-50 open-ended dollar-for-dollar basis. Under Fraser, the cost-sharing arrangement was scrapped and from 1981, the states were instead given capped Commonwealth health grants. <coughs> Medibank was reintroduced, rebranded as Medicare in 1984, and the Hawke government thereby recommitted the Commonwealth to the heavy subsidisation of mostly bulk-billed medical services. To offset the high costs to the federal government, the Commonwealth limited its financial exposure to the cost of public hospital care by continuing to give the states only capped grants in return for agreeing to provide public hospital services without user charges. Now given the intractable fiscal imbalance in the Federation and the decline in the value of general Commonwealth financial grants to the states in the post-Medicare period, the division of health funding responsibilities was less than ideal. The federal tier of government with the bulk of the taxing powers was not responsible for financing anything like the 50% of the actual cost of the real demand for public hospital care as the designers of Medicare intended. State governments were hereby left heavily exposed to the financial risk of growth in use of public hospitals. The state's financial problems were compounded by the large fall in private health fund membership the start of Medicare precipitated. The predictable response by financially overstretched state governments to the increased demand for free public hospital care was to implement blunt expenditure controls, frontline budget caps and bed cuts to ration access to hospital services. Financially stressed state governments controlled the, the cost of public hospitals and rationed care by abolishing local boards and putting the area health bureaucracies in charge so that bed cuts could occur with minimal grassroots opposition. In the last quarter of a century, Commonwealth and state funding caps have led to large cuts to public hospital bed numbers in excess of the efficiencies generated by technical innovations that cut lengths of stay. This in turn has led to increasing numbers of patients being forced to endure unreasonable waits for rationed hospital treatment. To cut a long story short, we basically still live today with the access problems that Medicare's structural flaws have created on the hospital side of healthcare. Now I want to stress what I'm not saying. All free and universal health systems have to ration care because government budgets are limited. This includes rationing hospital services, but my point is that the most serious inherent problem in the health system, which I think is the inequitable and unethical rationing of free health care by hospital queues, has been exacerbated or magnified by the structural funding inefficiencies at the heart of Medicare, which fails to distribute subsidies based on need and which distorts the overall demand and supply of health services. So what we end up with is overuse at the least acute, acute end of the health spectrum and undersupply at the most acute or hospital end. <coughs> 
and this is to say nothing of issues, important issues like inadequate cover for chronic conditions, which is another long-running sore in the health system. I'd also point out that the lack of funding argument in terms in relation to hospitals is no longer wholly valid. This is due to changes uh, that occurred to the Australian Healthcare Agreement in 2002, which required the states to match Commonwealth funding increases. It's also due to the introduction of the GST and the boom driven revenue increases the, state, um, the states have received. This has basically meant that, that government spending on public hospitals has grown enormously in the last decade, increasing in real terms from $22 billion to $30 billion. But the extra funding hasn't fixed the crisis because the bureaucratisation of the system over the last quarter of a century has created systemic problems that no funding increase can solve. We know that in bureaucratised entities, additional inputs do not uh, produce a proportional increase in outputs because by the time all the extra funding flows through the black hole of the bureaucracy, very little the additional money tends to make it through the front lines as extra services. What we've actually seen in Australia is the same thing as in the UK under the Blair government, which massively increased spending on the NHS. All that the increase in funding has proved is that it is possible to transform a low, lower cost, low performing system into a higher cost, low performing system. And the only way to turn this around is to introduce competitive incentives and market disciplines into the sector. What I would argue, however, is that the money the Commonwealth prefers for political reasons to spend paying for Medicare funded medical services could be better used to meet the un unmet demand for hospital care. But redirecting money into bureaucratic and inefficient public hospitals is no solution. And we've seen a, a, a sort of example of that. The, the, the AMA estimates that the extra billions that the Rudd government poured into public hospitals produced something like 12 extra beds nationally. Furthermore, even if funding flows were reconfigured, and spending on bulk billing curtailed, <coughs> queues for free hospital treatment would have to continue. In Britain, fee-for-service general practice has been replaced with a capitation payment system. Spending on GP services has been capped, but queues for hospital treatment remain to limit the total cost of the NHS. The bottom line, therefore, is that while ever Medicare remains primarily responsible for financing Australian healthcare, hospital funding caps and hospital queues will continue. So if we're serious about structural health reform that comprehensively addresses funding and access distortions, we need to talk about more than funding flow. We need to talk about principles, or rather the sound principles, which Medicare violates. Now, a soundly constructed insurance system does not insure people for all services, no matter, sorry, a soundly constructed insurance system does not insure people for all services no matter how minor the health need and cost. It enables people to share exceptional risk involving major health problems and high cost medical procedures. A sound health insurance system should also respect the principle that all health services are not equal in terms of improving our health. Some services provided both in and out of hospital have a discretionary aspect that make them less deserving of subsidies to ensure access and thus subsidies should be allocated on a differential needs basis. No properly configured insurance system should therefore cover minor medical costs from first dollar spent as Medicare does. A sound and sustainable insurance system therefore requires a front end deductible and or co-payment that members must pay to avoid overuse and trivial, i.e. non-catastrophic and non-chronic claims. Now by contrast, when three quarters of GP visits are bulk billed in Australia, when three quarters of all non-hospital care is government funded, when individuals are paying for only 12% of the costs from their own pockets, it's impossible to tell how many billions of dollars are being wasted on millions of unnecessary services. What Medicare therefore exemplifies is the intrinsic moral hazard that all subsidised fee-for-service third-party insurance arrangements can create in both public and private health systems. And this is the big lesson which we've learned from the increasingly unaffordable United States private health system, which is that it is impossible to insure people for all health services without overuse causing a cost and premium spiral. The other side in Australia in a public system is that you get the sort of arbitrary rationing that I've been talking about as the, as the counterweight. Control costs, but you ration care severely. What I would therefore argue is that to avoid arbitrary rationing in a public insurance system or an unaffordable cost spiral in a private insurance system, we need to go back to first principles. The reform goal should be to find an optimal structure which incorporates the following design features. 
Individuals should self-insure for minor needs, discretionary services and more predictable health costs. Payment by third-party insurers should be reserved for purchasing high-cost non-discretionary treatments for catastrophic and chronic illness from competing providers. Personal responsibility, consumer sovereignty and price signals should be restored by using deductibles and co-payments to control costs and deter unnecessary use of marginal services. I'm going to try and bring this all together. My paper therefore proposes that four key principles should guide the debate about structural health reform. The first is that scarce health resources and subsidised access to health services, sorry, scarce health resources and subsidised access to health services must be allocated on a needs basis to ensure timely access to essential hospital care. Second is that excessive universal subsidisation of minor health expenses must cease and individuals must pay for these services out of their own pockets to prevent overuse, making use of personalised funding instruments such as a health savings account. A HSA would prevent waste, I think, by applying the principle that nobody spends a government handout as wisely as cost-conscious consumers spend their own money. The third is that Medicare should be, should be demonopolised and replaced with a soundly constructed competitive insurance system which properly protects people against the risk of high cost, the risk and high cost of exceptional health events along the lines proposed under the Medicare Select Health and Health insurance voucher scheme which was proposed by the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission. That's one of the options for reform. The fourth is it to promote personal responsibility for health costs and controlled usage of health services while avoiding arbitrary rationing. A rational system of insurance deductibles and co-payments must apply for, for non-chronic care and marginal hospital procedures paid out of personal health savings. I think the advantages of this structure would be numerous. HSAs would end the useless churn involved in the MBS and we would have no excuse not to sack most of the 5,000 bureaucrats ungainfully employed in the Federal Department of Health. It would also reduce the cost of private insurance administration since millions of small claims and transactions would not have to be processed. There would also be a corresponding reduction in paperwork for doctors once their bills are paid by swiping an access card linked to people's HSAs. HSAs covering minor covering the minor expenses of millions of Australians would also keep down the cost of insurance. The national insurance voucher would be risk rated so resources would be allocated based on need and insurers would have a financial incentive to enrol patients with established conditions. The voucher would also only cover a minimum package of chronic and acute care. Again this would reduce the cost of the vouchers and apply proper insurance principles. The Medicare Select Plan also requires that taxpayer funded vouchers be supplemented by a community rated private premium paid for by all members. This would allow people to have the flexibility to insure for whatever services they like outside the minimum package of care and they could uh, insure for the full cost of services if they want to, wanted to, but the extent of their coverage would be reflected in the much higher cost of the premium. I think what would happen is that most people would be likely to insure themselves as they do for other adverse events and reserve insurance for only high cost uh, claims only and then have a plan with a high deductible or, and co-payments as well. There'll also need to be an additional government rebate on the private premium for low income groups to ensure universal coverage. Ideally, however, I think everyone should try and pay something out of their own pockets so that they're indirectly exposed to the cost of healthcare and to promote maximum price competition between insurers. But depending on what level the income rebate kicks in, you can make the scheme as redistributive or as unredistributive as you liked. What I think this structure would do would set limits on government responsibility for health and greatly increase personal responsibility and would both maximise private contributions to health costs and target public support based on need. I think the proposed reforms and the underpinning principles are important because the challenges facing the Australian health sector are larger than but closely connected to the waste on both, hospital, on both the hospital and on hospital sides of health care that Medicare permits. Federal governments in generational reports have, pred have predicted that the combined effects of population ageing, expensive new medical technology and ever rising consumer expectations will place unsustainable burdens on government budgets in coming decades. What is unspoken in these reports is that if the cost is unaffordable, the money won't be spent and the queues for treatment will simply grow longer in the future. The most likely outcome 
is that basic hospital care will be rationed even more stringently in 2020 and beyond. And given the looming demographic time bomb, I think it would be madness to persist with an inefficient scheme like Medicare that permits high spending on unnecessary care and squanders resources on hospital bureaucracy. Without change, the community will continue to forego essential services while spending an increasing proportion of national income on services that in the end don't really improve our health. Furthermore, the only way we can hope to fund all the sophisticated health care we will want in the future is by saving over time to pay for it through the kind of properly constructed insurance system I've been talking about. HSA would also require people to save to fund lifetime health costs which naturally rise as people age. At the same time, we also need to use market forces to encourage innovation and boost productivity so we can get more and better health care for every dollar we spend. Now, the structure I'm proposing would advance this agenda by facilitating meaningful reform in the area with large potential for efficiencies. What it would allow is for the public hospital system to be debureaucratized and corporatized by placing each public hospital under the control of an independent board of directors. Each hospital board would have full administrative and budgetary control and be responsible for setting the price of its services in competition with other private and public facilities. These prices would be fully contestable by the insurers who, once Medicare is demonopolised, will be responsible for purchasing hospital services on behalf of their members. The introduction of market forces into the, hospital sec into the public hospital sector will lower costs and improve quality. As in other areas of the economy subject to structural reform, com the community will end up receiving more and better hospital services for what, as the cost pressures of coming decades hit, will be our increasingly scarce health dollars. So what are the chances of pulling this off? I think the need for change is compelling, but what of the will to do it? On this point, the memoirs of another very successful ex-Prime Minister contain a very interesting statement that highlight the problem. In his autobiography, Tony Blair wrote that as technology advances and people live longer, there's no way the healthcare systems of developed nations can survive at a reasonable cost with a minimum level of equity and provision without putting individual responsibility and public health policy at the centre of the debate. Blair basically bailed the cat on the unsustainable fiction of a free and universal health system. But only once he was safely out of politics and free to say what we might suspect no serving politician could say and survive electorally. And if we looked at his record as Prime Minister in terms of implementing what he later, later in the day preached, I think we would find that his achievements as a health reformer were undistinguished at best. This really brings us back where we began, which is the political viability of reform. In his memoirs, John Howard reflected on the nature of Australian politics. And in the words of David Martin Jones, distills a series of astute lessons about the political conduct necessary to secure meaningful reform. Howard argued that Australians are, are pragmatic, worldly people who respond well to governments which ask them difficult things, provided they are taken into the confidence of, of the government and the nature of the national interest is laid out. I think that statement is generally true, as is Howard's follow-up lesson that the Australian electorate is innately conservative and resistant to change unless a convincing case has been made. But it is also true that health is treated in exactly the opposite fashion by politicians of all stripes. Myth and dissembling is the rule instead of honesty and understanding. Above all, magic pudding thinking prevails as people are, promises, are promised all services for free despite the impossibility and the conspicuous failure to deliver on this promise for two and a half decades. Now I don't doubt that straightening out the distortions that mar Australian healthcare is a huge and politically challenging task. However, the first step on the road to reform is for policymakers, stakeholders and the public to understand the reasons why the health system needs to be restructured. Now, so long as we ignore the issues of resource allocation, coverage and equity that surround Medicare, the distortions that compromise the effectiveness of Australian health care will persist. Now, for this reason, I found the reaction to my paper quite interesting and quite encouraging. I did a number of interviews when it was released and both the interviewers and the callers were concerned about the impact that scrapping bulk billing might have on poor people and they generally feared the whole idea of going down the US path. 
you know, I think that was fair enough and you know, this was in keeping with the Australian commitment to the fair go. Hence they were reassured when they were told that a health savings plus an insurance voucher approach would maintain universal coverage while encouraging responsible use of services. But the big surprise I found was that the scrapping of bulk billing wasn't rejected out of hand like we would have expected. And what I sensed was that many agreed that Medicare is wasteful because they personally know friends, relatives and neighbours who go to the doctor unnecessarily because it's free. I also sensed enormous frustration with the long waits for hospital care. And what I think is out in the community is a yearning for a better way to do things, which meant that people were interested in the sort of innovations that I was proposing. What this has led me to conclude is that the sacred cow might not be as sacred as we think, nor might it be the impediment to reform that we presume it to be, if the problems with the current setup are properly explained. <coughs> and the, the basic message that I've repeated tonight, that we waste money on overuse of bulk build services and that we unfairly control costs by rationing hospital care and that we need to rethink how we pay for health care to eliminate hospital queues and create a sustainable system cut through in this modest level. Now, I think this is significant if we apply the Howard lesson. To achieve meaningful health reform, we need to keep talking honestly about the problem and then we need to keep promoting understanding of and the strength of the case for change. For if the political culture does reflect Australian pragmatism, explaining the problems and setting out the solution will, it follows, build the constituency in favour of reform. But if we keep telling ourselves that health reform is a political impossibility, it will be. The alternative is to change the conversation, change the debate, and then change the system. Thank you. <coughs>